All right, so uh, if you would please make your way back to your table, we're gonna start. Uh, I'm gonna start with the great news. We found Dr. Single, he's here, and, and uh, he will be moderating the next session. Uh, my other announcement, by the end of this session, after we do the discussion, there will be a group picture. Everyone in this room, you'll be lined up here and we'll take pictures, okay? So Dr. Single. Dr. Single is the director of the liver cancer, uh, is director of hepatology uh, at UT Southwestern. He's still wondering, is he Dr. Single or not Dr. You are Dr. Single. Uh, you are? Fine. I'll just come in. Just, just, just come back <laughs> before we lose you here. Uh, he, he will be <laughs> giving the next talk. Uh, uh, Dr. Single is funded by CPRIT and NIH and several other places to study liver cancer. He's one of our local, but also now national and international experts on liver cancer. And today he will talk about uh, the early detection part of the uh, spectrum. Uh, Dr. Single. Thanks, Hashem. Um, so I know that um, Hashem thought I showed up late because he thought I liked sleeping in, but it was meant to be symbolic um, and purposeful. So it was meant to symbolize that we're coming into the liver cancer fight late, but not too late. We still have a chance to win this, and that's why I showed up five or seven minutes late. So let's see, so I was assigned to talk about detection, diagnosis um, of HEC, and uh, really implications for healthcare and health policy. Here you can see my disclosures, um, and I will tell you when it's relevant um, in terms of the slides. So once again, I'm gonna start with just some basic epidemiology to highlight um, you know, some of the facts that we heard this morning, but I know that we've heard a lot of information, and I think I'm gonna try to distill this down into a couple slides. When we think of liver cancer mortality and burden here, I think some of these are the facts that we need to remember. We need to remember that this is already a common cancer, and we're going in the wrong direction in terms of mortality. So here you can see the top 15 causes of cancer death in the United States um, from the SEER, Medicare, the SEER database. And we've seen notable improvements in terms of mortality for most common cancers. So these are the ribbons that you see across all of the months, lung cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer. We're doing a better and better job because we are finding these cancers earlier and we're able to have more and more effective treatments. And you take a look at this, and in the red bars, you see the cancers where, we, where we're going in the wrong direction. Pancreas cancer, brain cancer, and you can see by far leading the way in terms of the wrong direction is liver cancer mortality. This is rapidly increasing when we think of this from the United States perspective. Now, of course, as a non-Texas native, sort of somebody who moved here now about 12 years ago, I recognize Texas is Texas. It's part of the U.S., but it's different than the U.S. And, uh, you know, whenever I give these talks in Texas, we always have to highlight what is it here in terms of Texas. And this is a problem here in Texas. So this is a common cancer here in Texas, and we're once again going in the wrong direction. And this is one of the cancers where we're going in the wrong direction across all different subgroups. So it doesn't matter if you're non-Hispanic white, Hispanic, um, non-Hispanic black, it doesn't matter what racial ethnic group you are, it doesn't matter if you're male, female, et cetera, these incidence rates are increasing, so this is a cancer where we need to solve this now. Five-year survival for cancer. So once again, going back to sort of a different way to portray um, the same idea on the first slide, we've seen notable improvements in terms of cancer survival, survival across most common cancers. When you take a look at what cancers we're doing poorly in, liver cancer mortality started poor and it remains poor um, over time. So this is one of the few cancers where the five-year survival remains below 20%. So when we think of this now, once again, we all know sort of that Ben Franklin adage, right? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so you heard from the morning sessions all about primary prevention. So these are preventing in terms of, you know, Sumit's sort of nice um, uh, mnemonic in terms of repeat. So we're finding these sort of, uh, you know, risk factors. We're trying to intervene upon these risk factors so we can prevent the development of liver cancer, curing hepatitis C, treating fatty liver disease, et cetera. This is by far the best paradigm that we can do moving forward. 
However, it's not going to be 100% effective and we're not gonna solve this in everyone. There are still going to be some patients who progress to developing chronic liver disease, advanced chronic liver disease, and will be at risk for developing liver cancer. And so when we think of the prevention paradigm, there's primary prevention, which you've heard about, and then there's secondary prevention. So finding these cancers at an early stage when we can continue to do better. So this still falls under that same paradigm of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so this is the other aspect which we need to focus on if we want to do a better job in terms of reducing HEC mortality. So now, why would we ever do HEC screening, right? So this is something which this doesn't get the same press as colon cancer screening, breast cancer screening, but I'm gonna start by talking about some of the evidence base for this, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the failures in terms of why we're not doing as well as we should. So when we, whenever we think of cancer screening, cancer screening is to improve um, uh, survival to reduce cancer-related mortality. And you can see here from sort of a face validity perspective, there's a strong differential prognosis if you're found at an early stage versus a late stage. When we think of liver cancer, at least when I think of liver cancer, I think of this in the same camp as pancreas cancer. Highly fatal cancer, it's one of those few cancers where you're like, I don't wanna get that because there aren't sort of, this isn't, the survival is poor. But, what we don't think of very often is if you're found at an early stage, this is a curable cancer. So we have things like liver transplantation, surgical resection, ablation where we can actually go in and burn this cancer. And these are curative and associated with a median survival greater than 10 years. And the reason we think of liver cancer as being such a bad cancer is because we continue to find people at late stages when we don't have those curative therapies. And you're gonna hear about some of the exciting advances that we have in therapies, and I, I, I'm all into that. Like, I think the advances in terms of therapeutics are amazing. Immunotherapy, as you'll hear about, amazing. But despite that, the survival is still two to three years. So when we think of this, and you think of a liver cancer, it doesn't matter how much we improve the therapeutics, the biggest differential is finding people early when we can cure cancer, and so that's what we need to focus on. So, professional society guidelines recognize this, they recommend HCC screening. This has been built into sort of many of the professional society guidelines, including those from liver societies and from cancer societies. So built into the NCCN recommendations, built into the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease recommendations. This is something where people who are involved in this field recognize this. However, it does not have USPSTF recommendations. It doesn't have broad recommendations outside of these societies that are intimately aware of these data and intimately involved in this space. Now, professional society guidelines recommend or identify target populations for screening, including those with cirrhosis. And I'm not gonna go through the epidemiologic data for this. You heard some of this from this morning, but these are patients primarily who develop liver cancer in the setting of advanced chronic liver disease Typically, cirrhosis. Over 80%, if not over 90% of patients who develop HCC in the United States as well as Texas do so in the setting of cirrhosis, so we have an identifiable target population. This is something we can do. And this is the typical pathway for which this happens. So you can have one of the many chronic liver diseases you heard about this morning, viral hepatitis, alcohol-associated liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you develop chronic hepatitis, a portion of these patients go on to develop cirrhosis. And once you have cirrhosis, you have an annual risk of developing HCC of one to 3%. So that means that if you have 100 people, one to three of those people are gonna develop liver cancer every year, cumulative over time, which means in a period of three to four years, you have 10% of that population who develops liver cancer. This is a very, very high risk cohort. This is where we need to target our screening population. You've also already heard about some of the, the dramatic improvements, although incomplete work still, in terms of um, combating viral hepatitis. This is really more and more of a disease of non-viral etiologies, both alcohol and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, common conditions here in the state of Texas. So what are the data for HCC screening? So, um, you know, we have a large randomized control trial in chronic hepatitis B. This was conducted in China. I think we all recognize that chronic hepatitis B sort of patients from China may or may not reflect those patients from the United States. But there are several studies now, both in the United States as well as in Europe, that show a strong association between the receipt of screening, and I'll talk about how we do this soon, 
but the receipt of screening and improved clinical outcomes. So those patients who receive screening, significantly higher likelihood of being found at an early stage, significantly higher curative treatment receipt, and reduced HCC mortality. So you see here, most notably, we want to reduce mortality from cancer, improve overall survival. You see a 36% reduction in cancer-related mortality if you receive HCC screening versus not. So there's a strong association between screening and improved clinical outcomes. Now, okay, fine. Let's say you buy everything I've sort of sold you so far. You're like, yes, I understand we should be doing this. HEC screening is good. Now, how do we make this effective? How do we do this? And how do we make sure that it works in clinical practice? And I would argue that this really depends on primarily two things to happen. First, we need to make sure that it happens. So screening utilization, which I'll talk about for the, the last part of my talk, and having effective tests. So if you do this, you need a test that works. So what do we do? How do we do this? The nice thing is that HEC screening is actually used um, uh, or is performed using an abdominal ultrasound with or without a blood test called alpha feta protein. Now, th these tests, important to note, these are readily available. So it's not like we have limitations of ultrasound availability or blood test availability. So this isn't an MRI where it may be difficult to get in rural communities. Ultrasound is everywhere. Ultrasound is cheap. Ultrasound is non-invasive. So this is a test that is easy and can be performed. So what's the data in terms of um, ultrasound plus AFP in terms of um, how well it works? So when you take a look at this, you take a look at all of the studies that have looked at ultrasound and AFP in terms of, the, of finding this at an early stage, ultrasound and AFP detect the vast majority of tumors at an early stage. Over two thirds of patients are found at an early stage if we perform ultrasound and AFP. It's not perfect, but it is an effective modality to find liver cancer at an early stage. Second, there have been decision analyses that have compared this to no screening and we know that it's cost effective. So ultrasound and AFP was cost effective in the vast majority of simulations in this cost effectiveness analysis. So this is effective and cost effective. There, once again, in terms of the, the sort of paradigm of assessing this, this is a good strategy moving forward. Now, of course, we know that um, it's not perfect. I told you that it can detect two thirds of liver cancers at an early stage. We would all love to have something that would find 80, 90% of liver cancers at an early stage. I'm gonna show you a couple slides, not because I think it impacts policy today, but I wanna show you what's around the corner in terms of other modalities that may be coming out in case you're like two thirds isn't good enough. There are other strategies that are being evaluated which can augment what we have available in terms of ultrasound and AFP. So here you see a study that was done um, now about five years ago, looking at MRI-based screening modalities versus ultrasound-based modalities. Prospective study followed patients with cirrhosis over one and a half years. And you can see that MRI-based screening was more effective in this study than ultrasound-based screening. And I say this not because I think MRI-based screening is the answer for everyone. There's no way that we're gonna go to McAllen and say, put every one your, of your patients through an MRI every six months. However, this is something where it provides a framework which we can build off and, and augment what we can do by ultrasound. So A, this can be used in some centers to augment what we can do with ultrasound, particularly those in whom ultrasound may fail. And the second is that we are, we're pretty good at innovation. So you know, what we can do is, and there have been studies that have looked at this, an MRI is a 45 minute exam. There have now been studies where you take selected sequences and you can do an abbreviated MRI and you can do this in 15 minutes. And so if you're able to show that this is effective, which there are some early data showing this, this may augment what you can do in some larger cities where you have MRI capacity, Dallas, Houston, Austin, et cetera. So once again, promising data of we are trying to innovate and improve that test effectiveness as we move forward. Of course, as I mentioned, we have to consider um, issues of MRI capacity, costs, and so this isn't gonna be the answer to everyone, but I do think it can be helpful in selected patient populations. The other thing, and this is, um, I have to, this is where my conflict, I do consult for this company and I don't necessarily think that this specific biomarker is, is the answer per se, this is more so as an, as an example. But you know, um, uh, 
we and others are working on biomarker-based screening. So this is really taking a look at promising biomarkers. This is one of them. There's liquid biopsy techniques, many biomarkers that are coming to market um, over the next several years, which would allow us to go from an imaging-based strategy to a blood-based strategy. Now, of course, this solves many things, right? You may be able to e either keep test effectiveness or increase test effectiveness, but you're able to do this easily. So no longer do I need to come back for an ultrasound a different day. I can just get this when I see my you know, provider and get it the same day. So you're able to augment what I'm gonna talk about soon in terms of test uptake. The, um, and I, I, I show this slide basically to show that these biomarkers, although early data, are promising. So you can see here when you take a look at the second, fourth, and sixth row of this table and just focus on the first column, you can see that this biomarker panel is able to achieve sensitivities of 60 to 80% for early stage detection. So this biomarker is able to detect two thirds or up to four fifths of liver cancers at an early stage by itself. Once again, early data, we need these to be validated in other sort of studies, but this is promising and we see similar performance for other emerging biomarkers. Once again, in terms of Texas, Texas is leading the way in terms of validating these cohorts. So there are two national, large, multi-center um, uh, sort of cohort studies that are being done, which will allow validation of these biomarkers, one of them being funded by the NCI, the other one being funded by CPRIT. These, these, these um, infrastructures are now allowing validation, which will allow these biomarkers to hopefully come to, to market soon. Last couple slides here, and then I'll be done. Um, in terms of, I talked about test effectiveness. The other thing that I want to talk about is obviously we need to make sure this happens. Um, and so this is the other aspect in terms of making sure that we're able to have effectiveness in terms of reducing mortality. And this is an issue that we need to solve. HEC screening is underused in clinical practice. Here you can see several studies that have evaluated this. So this is a systematic review and meta-analysis of those studies. And when you take a look at this, when you take a look at overall, only one in four patients with cirrhosis undergo HCC screening. We clearly need to do better. And when you take a look at this, it's worse if you have non-viral liver disease. It's worse if you're followed by a primary care provider. And worse, I mean lower. These, this is where the war is being fought. And this is where the war is being lost. So we need to do better in terms of increasing screening in terms of these areas. Now, I can give a 45-minute talk, which I'm not going to, Hashem. I can give a 45-minute talk on just this aspect in terms of what we need to do, all the barriers. I'm going to simplify it in terms of one line. There are patient and provider barriers, both sides of this, in terms of why this doesn't happen. And we need multi-level interventions to solve this. And I'm happy to sort of go through this in the Q&A. But it's, it's a complex issue, as many of you would imagine, that we need to solve. And here you can see one study in which we did this, and we broke this down into, we think of HEC screening, just do it. But this is a multi-step process. You need to identify the patients, you need to recommend this, patients need to have this done. And when you take a look at this, there are failures across that entire spectrum or um, in terms of making this one step, even a larger cascade happen. And so once again, highlighting the need for multi-level interventions across this entire cascade to make this happen. One of the key things here, and you've already heard this this morning, it's hard to recognize that at-risk population. I would argue, you know, Barbara showed this very nice sort of study that, you know, I had the honor of being involved with her in, in terms of identifying hepatitis C, you know, curing those patients, and we would recognize some of those patients of having cirrhosis. I would argue, much like Sumit pointed out, identifying fatty liver, we're in a completely different game and a harder game. I mean, we passed, quote unquote, past level one, and now we're going to like level eight. I mean, this is a hard game to fight, and we need to sort of think through how we're going to do this. But multi-level interventions are the way we're going to solve this. There have been studies that have looked at interventions. I'm not going to go through each in detail, but I just want to highlight that there have been attempts in terms of a looking at the efficacy. So how well do these work in a study population? But there have been very few studies that have looked at implementing these in clinical practice and now seeing the effectiveness as we roll this out into routine clinical practice. And this is going to be one of the next stages of what we need in this area. So in summary, at-risk patients include those with cirrhosis. And as you've already heard this morning, we're seeing this shift in terms of the epidemiology from a viral to a non-viral world. And this is important to consider across the board as we think through prevention, screening, and treatment. HCC screening has good data, imperfect, but good data showing that this is effective. Right now, we use this using simple, readily available tests, ultrasound and a blood test alpha-feta protein. 
We have novel things coming around market, which will be better. We'll have to think about how we implement those in clinical practice. We need to do screening. It's underused and due to multiple sort of patient and provider barriers. We need to think through what interventions, multi-level interventions can be performed to improve this. And I think that what we really need in terms of, I would argue, is continued generation of high-level data evaluating the screening benefits and harms, this idea of overall value. Um, and I think that this is going to be critical because we need to move beyond professional society guideline recommendations and we need to really focus on the idea of getting CPRT recommendations or NCI recommendations or USPSTF recommendations, broader recommendations that will speak to our primary care colleagues so it's not just a subspecialty battle. Um, thank you so much, um, and I'll hand it off to Samit to, to invite the next speaker. Um, thanks, Amit. Uh, so, you know, so, so far in the morning, we've talked about uh, prevention at the risk factor level. Now we're talking about screening uh, for HCC and, you know, where the barriers exist there. And now we're going to sort of pivot in terms of, of, of treatment. And um, I'll set up the stage a little bit for uh, both uh, Dr. Kasab, who's going to speak, and Dr. Rich, and I'll share a few thoughts. Um, let me see. Yeah, that one's right. Um, so Hashem asked me, he's like, you know what, these, you're, you're surrounded by three experts, Dr. Kasib, Dr. Single, Dr. Rich. This is not your field. What can you do? So I said, okay. If I had to create a children's book or a picture book on HCC treatment, how would I do it? So I said, okay, this is my attempt, okay? So if there was a children's book, how would it be? So uh, cirrhosis and liver cancer, uh, you know, we talked about this. And as Amit pointed out is, you know, most are in that red box. Most don't get detected early across the world. Uh, but the goal is to move, you know, patients from that red box to that green box, right? How do we, you know, change our paradigm so we're detecting and diagnosing early in terms of liver cancer? And what are the principles of liver cancer treatment? And, and you'll hear more of the details. But this is sort of the framework. You have sort of three pathways that happen at the same time. If somebody has liver cancer, again, the stipulation is that, you know, I caught them early. Uh, what are the three things I'm going to think about? From the cancer therapy standpoint, it's do I take this cancer out or do I cauterize it or give it local therapy? From a transplant standpoint, and, you know, for the, the non-medical audience, uh, you know, with transplant is a cure for liver cancer, and I'll get into that, is it will treat the cancer and the liver disease. And the question in our mind is, is this patient ever going to be a candidate for transplant? Never, now, or later. And then the third part is treating the underlying. You know, can we treat the cause? Um, and what liver maintenance do we need to do? So we're sort of doing these three things simultaneously when somebody comes in uh, with liver cancer. Um, and like any other cancers, uh, at this stage, therapy is and can be protocolized because of the work that's been done. So that's my, uh, the blue thing is the liver. The yellow thing is liver cancer, uh, one versus three. So if you have that, you know, based on tumor size, tumor characteristics, patient health, liver disease, uh, we can decide in a multidisciplinary setting. So same kind of concept, the care team concept that we talked about in screening and prevention applies here also, is now your team has shifted into hepatology, surgery, oncology, radiology, and the core sort of driver of all this is shared decision-making, um, multidisciplinary tumor boards to sort of help decide, you know, what do I do with that one spot, what do I do with that three spots, and think about therapy. And option A, somebody comes in really early, liver's pretty stable, uh, your sort of options are, you know, I can cut it out or I can try to treat it locally or, uh, you know, some form or the other to take care of it. And maybe that's all this patient needs for cure. Option B is I have multiple spots. What I can do is go in and try to cauterize it or, you know, put in chemotherapy directly to the cancer, uh, put a catheter into the liver, you know, give chemotherapy, give radiation. And in some patients now, it's, that's it. That's all you need. But in most patients, this sort of serves as the bridge uh, to get you to transplant if the patient is a transplant candidate because you're basically trying to buy time in, in this kind of multiple or progressing option. And then C is a transplant. And what transplant does, I mean, in, in this case, is pretty unique, is that one, 
it can treat your disease, right? If it's cirrhosis, it's gone. And two, uh, it can cure the cancer. So if we catch it enough early enough, then, then that's it. There's, of course, the asterisk of recurrence. But in most cases, you know, if things go well, you do it early enough, you're, you're in this option. And so what happens is when somebody comes to a transplant center is they wait for a transplant. But during that time, what we're trying to do is manage the cancer. Uh, the word we use is downstaging. Is so if somebody has significant burden, then you try to bring it down to a manageable level and sort of, you know, keep things stable. Or reminder that, you know, still even at this stage, about, you know, 15% of patients will progress regardless of what we do. And this hopefully will change uh, over time. And so what happens is once somebody hits the door and has liver cancer, at least at a large center, again, you're doing those three things at the same time. The treat cancer, evaluate for transplant, treat the underlying. From the treat cancer, again, the decision is, do I, is this stable enough to cut out or cauterize? Do I give local therapy? And then in both those cases, these patients sort of fall into this uh, cycle of imaging, visits, retreatment decisions, tumor board every three months. Second is evaluating for transplant. So this patient has to have access to a transplant center. Um, and then you think about, okay, what can, what's the best option? Living donation, deceased donation, and what if these patients progress while waiting? What can we do? And the third is having a team to help treat the underlying. For example, treat the hepatitis C. And again, the question becomes, is the liver healthy enough uh, to continue treatment? And as one can imagine, is throughout this whole paradigm, there's going to be gaps at every single level. Did this patient get ID'd early enough? Did this patient have access to uniform tumor boards across, across Texas? Did this patient have access to transplant? Uh, is the infrastructure there for monitoring, labs, imaging? Hope the patient doesn't lose insurance, because otherwise then what do we do? And then hope the patient doesn't progress, you know, despite our best efforts. But if you can sort of navigate all these things, you know, cure is possible. So now I'll hand it off to uh, two speakers. Uh, first one is, and I'll introduce both of them right now. Uh, so first is uh, Dr. Kaseb. Uh, he is a medical oncologist at MD Anderson. Uh, he has trained in Cairo. He's trained in Detroit. He's trained in Michigan. And for the last 10 years has been leading the effort here uh, from the oncology standpoint. And two is uh, Dr. Rich. She's currently at UT Southwestern. She went to the Ohio State. And the the was trademarked, I think, about June 2022, because it was a huge moneymaker for Ohio State. Uh, and now she's been here, and her interest has been uh, looking at disparities by both by, by sex, gender, uh, race, socioeconomic status in terms of treatment for HCC. So Dr. Kassab. Morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me, and it's a, a real privilege to be here. And in case you haven't noticed so far, you know how much physicians and healthcare workers love these settings. It's because of two main reasons: we we love to lecture and tell people what to do. <laughs> and that's actually from our patients, because our patients they always tell us, "Doctor, just tell me what to do. I don't know." So, but joking aside, uh, we all are here because people trust us with their. Uh, life decisions, right? Whether we're physicians, healthcare workers, or policy makers, people look up to us um, to make those life and death decisions and help them with their life affairs. So, um, so today I'm not here uh, to uh, tell you uh, what you know in terms of your established beliefs. I'm not here to reiterate and reinforce them. I'm going to be um, challenging you and, and thinking with you. So I'm going to uh, be talking about briefly a few slides about what we do in clinic to treat patients, but evolve from this to uh, stimulate your thinking and, and come up with some suggestions that you guys can take it to the halls of power and, and change policies and help us help our patients. So um, how do you move the slides from here? This is my uh, clinical trial research portfolio um, support. So these are the objectives today. Uh, I'm going to walk through uh, the importance of early detection uh, of um, liver cancer. And for on the other side of uh, treating liver cancer, I, I, I see the heavy cost of late diagnosis like our 
our speakers talked about, you know, when you diagnose early on, you can offer more curative options, and I see the other end of the spectrum. So that's why um, I'm going to briefly talk about the importance of this uh, in, from our standpoint as oncologists, and then talk about how healthcare policies can improve patients' access to care, uh, to standard and evolving therapies uh, for liver cancer, review the potential uh, indicators of treatment outcome, predictors and prognostic indicators, and discuss how to help improve survival and potentially cure liver cancer in toxins using those systemic therapies. So when it comes to liver cancer, this is how we look at it in clinic. The first question we always ask is, do we have liver-only disease or metastatic stage four disease? So for liver-only disease, if the patients have advanced cirrhosis, the only cure is liver transplant. And this is only available for 5% of patients. And if they do have liver-only disease and no advanced cirrhosis, they can go for surgical resection. And this is about 10, 15%. So only one in five patients could really be offered curative option, and even in those I have a slide about this. 20% of those patients, uh, I mean 60% of those patients who get resection, they end up recurring within two years. So even resection itself is not uh, totally curative. And then, of course, for patients with stage 4 disease, they go for systemic therapy. Sorry, I'm on call today. I promise I'm not going to interrupt my talk, but if you hear any, anything, you know what it is. So... Um, so this is, you know, um, a, a slide that really taps into uh, the importance of early detection here. And you see here that those patients who are on the left side of the slide with very early disease, uh, look at how much survival here. The, uh, so those patients have um, more than five years survival if they fall within this category, early diagnosis here. And the intermediate stage, more than two and a half years, and this is exactly why early detection is very critical. And uh, to uh, Amit's point, you know, we really have to think out loud about this. Uh, if the, uh, if the, the best scenario uh, to, um, um, is to um, 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 uh, help primary care physicians and reward them for screening, that could be an option. We all know um, how much they get per patient, and they see 30 patients a day in their primary care clinics. So to enable them and encourage them to do this, maybe a healthcare policy would be to encourage them and reward them for screening those patients, so that way they can also uh, find time and resources to do that. Um, so. While the uh, red and the right side of the um, uh, spectrum here, this is where um, um, uh, my population of patients live. Unfortunately, this is about 70% uh, of patients who cannot go for any surgical resection or transplant or curative options. So they end up in our clinic, and their survival is in the range of one, one and a half to two years. Uh, so very poor survival outcome, less than 10% live um, after five years. So um, this is just a snapshot at you know, how much uh, improvement in terms of systemic therapy we have um, witnessed in the last few years. Um, this study, and MD Anderson was part of uh, the global team leading it, established a new um, a treatment paradigm for hepatocellular carcinoma patients with immunotherapy. So IV medications stimulate our own immune system to attack the cancer, very innovative. And this came out from many, many clinical trials before that led up to this. And the response rate, 30% of patients have tumor shrinkage, so they can even um, uh, go for other curative options down the line if they get excellent response, such as surgery or transplant. So the major take-home point from uh, these uh, new immunotherapies are that patients with excellent liver functions uh, tolerated the treatment well and had excellent uh, response. And there was a trend towards better benefit in patients with uh, low-volume disease and patients who had hepatitis B and C. So the bottom line is uh, we know those patients. They are uh, frequent visitors to our hepatology clinics. So if we can diagnose liver cancer early on again to that point, they will have good liver functions and they will respond better to our therapies as well. And this is just a snapshot at what we have other than uh, this regimen that um, I uh, alluded to. So we have other treatments here, including this one, which is immunotherapy, purely immunotherapy, and these two are also immunotherapy-based. And uh, so three immunotherapy-based in the second line, 
two immunotherapy based in the front line, and the rest of them are drugs that are called targeted therapies. So we are not treating our patients with toxic therapies. So these treatments are fairly tolerable, and mixing them with immunotherapy enabled us to have much higher response rate. And this is all thanks to advances in clinical trials and um, enrolling patients into them has been also a challenge. So this is also part of healthcare policies, how to um, grant patients access to top-notch clinical trials, even those patients in underserved population uh, addressing healthcare disparities as well in patients who don't have access to insurance even. So these you know, policy uh, um, uh, decisions could really enable our patients with certain bills uh, the right to access those clinical trials, such as a few years ago, a few years ago, we uh, probably all heard about the right to um, um, treat, so patients had access to uh, compassionate use access to cancer therapies, and that was uh, passed in, in 2019. So uh, the same thing here could be applicable, the right to participate in clinical trials, how we encourage insurance carriers to support this. Some of them actually, once they know patients is on clinical trial, they don't want to pay even for standard of care. So all of these things are very critical, and our patients suffer from them in real life. So all of these things I just am throwing out there so we can think about them together because patients trust us with those decisions. So moving quickly, a few slides here to talk about, you know, the, um, um, how um, we um, improved outcome in hepatocellular carcinoma patients and how we can continue our march towards that goal. So I alluded to the uh, risk factor um, effect on the treatment outcome. This is a study that showed, you know, that hepatitis C patients benefited the best from certain um, drugs here, which was oral drugs. And this here is immunotherapy uh, combination and hepatitis B patients benefited best from this. So we do have some differential outcome based on the underlying risk factors. So it's important to diagnose those risk factors as well early on. They don't only lead to evolution of cancer, but there is differential outcome there, even in established patients in terms of response to therapy. And um, this is a study we did at Anderson to uh, subcategorize those patients based on their liver reserve, you know, so we developed a scoring system. And uh, the point here I'm trying to make with this is the fact that um, these biomarker, you know, studies and trials necessitate patients to undergo frequent blood draws here, so reimbursement to support patient return visits, for example, or even just the cost of shipping, you know, those samples back and forth. All of these things are uh, barriers to our advances in, uh, in clinical trial and research, and there is no good solution for it. So we sometimes rely on our patient support services or some clinical trial partial support of it, but um, providing some healthcare bills to actually um, uh, mandate support for patients' transportation and for patients who don't have access to clinical trials to remove those barriers is critical to advancing cancer care in, in, in the state and the country as well. So, uh, so we talked here about the uh, risk factors, the importance of uh, diagnosis patients early on, um, and this is, again, you're going to keep hearing about this throughout the day, and this is just the, um, uh, from our standpoint as treating oncologists. And the clinical dilemma here, I talked about this briefly in patients, even those patients who undergo surgical resection, that most of them, 60% within two years, recur. So the clinical dilemma here is that the majority recur after surgery and there is no standard of care to help them to uh, provide a lower recurrence rate after surgery. Um, well, we did this study that was the first study to tap into this population at MD Anderson where we did immunotherapy for six weeks before uh, resecting the tumors, and one-third of them had complete response, 100% necrosis, and they never recurred, while the rest of the patients, half of them, still recurred. So the point here, would, it comes to this kind of uh, trials to lower the recurrence even uh, after surgery for those who are uh, supposedly are cured, is to go through this with new adjuvant treatment, meaning treatment before surgery, and then uh, at surgical uh, time, we get another um, uh, snapshot at the biomarkers to understand those who responded versus those who did not, and then uh, come up with a personalized approach. And along this line, we talked about the importance of supporting those patients to uh, not only to gain access to clinical trials, but to continue on them and finish them and follow up. And we had a lot of patients who dropped out because they have difficulty in transportation, for example, and some clinical trials and even IRB protocols would pro prohibit us from providing selecting those patients who can get 
financial support where there's those who, who shouldn't because we shouldn't discriminate and if we're going to offer it, we have to offer it to everyone. So this is also kind of the barrier that you know, uh, policymakers could help us with in terms of um, putting our heads together and coming up with a solution uh, to blank umbrella to help all patients, um, whether they have financial uh, burden or not, of course, focusing more on uh, patients who are underserved, but in the meantime, understanding these barriers have, are multifaceted. So we really have to have a very good group put together, healthcare workers, policymakers, and patients advocates as well, to kind of um, figure out how to grant patients access, how to keep them on clinical trials and maintain them, even if that's what it takes to provide them with financial support, to provide them with different policies, to allow us, uh, among you know, those clinical trial budget, to budget for patients, uh, to, for transportation for all of them, uh, instead of uh, trying to pick and choose and then having some hurdles with the IRB in terms of selecting patients and, and all of that. So these are all very um, uh, critical points for us in clinic, and I'm glad we're having this session today where we can share uh, this with you. And last slide here, just stepping into how a multidisciplinary approach in large centers can improve patients' outcome. And this, this is a homegrown, came from the VA here, and uh, thousands of patients here um, were analyzed, and they looked at different disease settings, and uh, 50,000 patients um, here were analyzed, and 65% of them received uh, care at those large centers with multidisciplinary approach. And of course, as uh, predicted, five-year survival was much better, much higher in those patients who, uh, so if this is what it takes, and maybe a healthcare bill to look into uh, extra support, not extra support, but yeah, the right word I'm looking uh, forward to is how to reward you know, large centers to receive those patients and to look for them and help them out because the outcome is much better uh, for diseases like liver cancer at the large centers. And there are ways of doing that without discriminating against small institutions and small primary care settings. So this is also another very important point, how to reward big centers to take care of those patients and how to enable them to have the required infrastructure support to enable them to take care of more patients. So this is uh, it. You know, we talked about how we can integrate, you know, innovative therapies to improve patients' outcome and towards that goal we really need teamwork and new policies to financially support our patients and their families and help grant them access to new therapies and, and trials. Um, also talking about supporting efforts to removing the roadblocks in, 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 in this area to increase the cure rate in liver cancer. I talked briefly about immunotherapy before surgery uh, as a, a perfect example to achieve that. And then also, this is very, very important, data sharing and, and policies towards unified electronic medical records. This is very, very critical, and this is actually going to also help us lower the financial burden on the healthcare system and shift it. You know, if I see a patient at MD Anderson who just had a scan in Dallas, two weeks ago, I cannot even have an access to the actual images, so I have to get my own scans here. So this is another $8,000 spent within two weeks on top of what the patient spent in, in Dallas. So, so unified electronic medical records, I know there has been a lot of talks about, about this for years and years, but it's time to look into these things. And if COVID taught us anything, it's, it's, it's just to push forward the tech. Telehealth has been in our minds and hearts for years and years, and it happened overnight during COVID. So I, I'm a strong believer that we can really reach this goal of unified electronic medical records. Uh, and um, finally here, um, we talked about screening patients and importance of early detection and uh, the uh, designing trial approaches based on disease etiology and uh, developing some underlying liver disease um, reserve tools. So all of this just goes back to the same issue of granting patients access, unified medical records, and how to work together towards healthcare policies to encourage and enable our patients to participate in trials and also reward large centers to take care of those patients. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. So <laughs> trying to figure out the thing here. Um, so, you know, my talk, as um, Dr. Zarani met, uh, mentioned earlier, is going to be trying to weave through some of these concepts that have been already discussed by the other speakers about, we've talked about what are the gaps in HCC detection and treatment, but how can we address some of these at the community level? So that's going to be my goal here today. So here are my disclosures. They're not um, related to this talk. 
So just an overview, we'll be summarizing current gaps in HCC early detection, diagnosis, and treatment at the community level in Texas. And I'm gonna be trying to highlight some of the specific barriers to screening and guideline concordant care, as you've heard um, mentioned by the other speakers. These can occur at the patient, provider, and system levels. So we'll be discussing that. Um, and also how can we, what are some solutions or some interventions to eliminate the disparities we see here in Texas with our patients? So you've heard earlier that HCC is a highly fatal cancer. Um, Dr. Al Sarag, uh, you know, mentioned this as well as Singal that, you know, five-year relative survival is only 20%, and it's even lower in Texas with just 15% of Texans surviving um, uh, over five years when they have HCC. And this really translates. I think this is a quite a staggering figure into just a six into 16 years of loss of life for each liver cancer that we see in Texas. So. I think this is really quite sobering. Unfortunately, we detect most HCC, as you've heard throughout the previous talks, at a later stage. The whole goal of early detection, as we mentioned, is to detect HCC at a curative, an early stage when curative treatments such as surgery, liver transplantation are still available. However, over 50% of cases are diagnosed at later stages. And you can see here the bar graph on the right that this, the, the five-year survival just drops off to 12%, 3% really becomes quite dismal. So this is really the critical piece of how we can improve HCC mortality is early detection. Now, you've heard from Dr. Thrift and others that the burden of HCC is not equally distributed in the United States, both with incidence, but also with stage at diagnosis and mortality. And here are just some examples um, that I think are pretty striking. Uh, figures that show that it's not just racial and ethnic disparities or gender disparities, which we hear a lot about, but also socioeconomic disparities and even rural and urban disparities. So for example, black and Hispanic patients, 20% less likely to be diagnosed at an early stage compared to whites. We've shown that um, in our um, uh, hospitals in Dallas. Um, but also, you know, advanced stage tumors are more likely among those who are un uninsured or underinsured across all racial and ethnic groups. And rural patients are 10% more likely to have advanced stage HCC compared to those that live in urban areas like Dallas or Houston. So this kind of is setting up to show you that the burden is not equally distributed throughout the population. So even when we detect HCC at, an, at any stage, treatment delays are quite common. So you see here, this is data from the National Cancer Database. The red line is showing the proportion of patients that receive no treatment over the 2010s period. And you can see that you know, over one in four patients with HCC in the United States received no treatment at all. And the blue line is showing you patients that did receive treatment, but it was delayed. And you can see that one in five patients experienced treatment delays of over three months once they have HCC. This is early stage patients, late stage patients, all comers. And as you might imagine, this, the disparities continue here. So black, Hispanic, low SES patients are more likely to be untreated. They're more likely to be in that red line. And among those who are untreated, they're more likely to have the delays that are over three months, which you can imagine that might result in stage migration. Patient may no longer be eligible for curative therapies, et cetera. So what are some of the reasons for delays in HCC care? Well, we really tried to break this down. Um, this was a study we did at our center where we looked at what are the reasons? Why are patients having delayed diagnosis of over three months and why are they having delayed treatment? Um, and it's a little small here. I don't want you to read each part, but the blue, orange, and green bars represent patient, provider, and system level factors. So just some examples of a provider level factor that might impact disparities would be Maybe simply, as, as Dr. Singh also, maybe simply the provider doesn't order the test in a timely fashion that's needed or order the guideline concordant treatment. Perhaps the patient might miss the appointment, have issues with transportation, et cetera. There's also system level issues in terms of scheduling um, and other barriers. Um, and so all of this to say that I think we focus a lot on patient level barriers. You know, the patient didn't schedule the test, the patient didn't have transportation. But we have to think of this in terms of the broader picture that social determinants of health are really what drive cancer health disparities at the end of the day. Even um, as Dr. Turner pointed out, these aren't just individual behaviors. We can't focus on that. Even individual behaviors are really kind of um, are impacted by these social determinants of health, which are the conditions in which an individual you know, is born, lives, works, studies, et cetera. And you see all of those domains here. Further, these social determinants of health are influenced even further upstream by, so, um, by health policy and other structural factors. So 
um, you know, this is a common, I, I think this is a more um, new uh, kind of figure that you might see in the literature uh, currently, but where you have these very, very upstream factors that have been present in the United States for a long time. We have structural inequities. We have racism, discrimination, sexism, et cetera, that have led to policies that impact patients' everyday social determinants of health. And these lead to the far, far downstream disparate health outcomes that I showed you earlier. So this is quite complicated, as, as you can see. And what I like about this figure is it shows you that access to health care is just one piece of the puzzle. It's an important piece, but it's not the entire thing. So I'm gonna focus on access a little bit here in Texas for the next few slides, just to give you an idea, and then we'll come back around to the other factors. So um, there's nearly 30 million Texans, and over 3 million of them are classified as living in rural areas. So this is not a small number of people. We have a lot of counties in Texas. I thought these were some really striking figures showing that many Texans have limited access to healthcare as well as subspecialists. So 71 counties in Texas have no hospital. <laughs> 11 counties have no EMS station at all. And then we have only four NCI designated cancer centers in the larger cities. So you can imagine that if you live in West Texas, South Texas, you might really have a, a difficult time with not just transportation, but even being connected with a, a PCP or a subspecialist in the first place. And in fact, Texas leads the US in rural hospital closure since 2005. You also see the darker states here are the higher proportion of patients who are uninsured. 17% of Texans are uninsured. So you can see we're kind of leading the way uh, in the wrong area uh, in both regards. Um, there's also an increasing shortage of primary care physicians in Texas, which is a huge problem. And we've heard a lot about this during the COVID pandemic, I think nationally. This figure just really struck me, just going from 2019 to 2021, pre and post COVID, um, the darker areas are where there is, the whole county is in a shortage area of PCPs, meaning that less than one PCP for 3,500 residents. And look at how much of Texas has become dark blue just in the period of two years, um, with very few counties not being in a shortage area. And this is really, as, as several um, other speakers have mentioned, most patients with cirrhosis are cared for by PCPs. They're our partners, and so this is a huge issue. Um, they're not all gonna be seeing hepatologists like ourselves. So all of this translates into this geographic variation that we see in HCC mortality in Texas. You've seen several of the, the maps where South Texas, the darker areas have higher incidence, but also the mortality is worse in these areas as well. So when we think about how can we begin to conquer this, I think you know Amit alluded to the cancer care continuum where we need to look at all along from risk assessment, risk reduction, as Samit mentioned, to early detection, diagnosis, treatment, and finally survivorship. We heard from Amit that um, early detection, you know, we're really bad at utilization of HCC surveillance, less than one in four patients who are at risk. These are patients with, cir with cirrhosis are receiving guideline concordant HCC screening. And he mentioned that there's these various vulnerable points in the HCC screening cascade. It becomes really complex. And I think that this figure really ties in what all of the speakers were talking about. You know, I mentioned, I showed you the access in Texas up there in the red, identifying the patient as having cirrhosis or liver disease, as Samit mentioned. But even if you've identified the patient, there's still several steps where things could go awry. Um, what's very interesting um, is, of course, the failure to recognize cirrhosis is a huge barrier. This is even worse in people with NAFLD, which is kind of the, you know, the issue where, you know, when you have a positive hepatitis C test, much easier to think, hmm, this patient might have cirrhosis. But these patients with diabetes, it may not be recognized by, by PCPs or even gastroenterologists. Um, so this was a study from the VA showing that 25% of patients who were diagnosed with HCC had unrecognized cirrhosis at the time of their diagnosis. And those patients were six times more likely to have advanced stage HCC when they were diagnosed. Um, Amit talked about, you know, that screening failures can occur anywhere. Obviously, the provider ordering the surveillance test is a huge issue. Um, and this was a study that we did at, at Parkland. And the interesting thing was when the, the surveillance test was actually ordered, l less than 5% of patients failed to complete it. So if you, we put in the orders, we try to reduce the barriers. That's not saying there's not patient level barriers, um, but that's a, that's a huge part is just us putting in the orders as physicians. So clearly there's ways that we can try to make this easier on both PCPs and hepatologists, um, and even uh, you know, just using risk stratification tools through the EMR. 
Um, we talked a little bit about how provider and patient education is key to tell the patient, you know, why is surveillance important? Um, and we'll go over uh, in my last few slides a couple of interventions that have been done in this regard. Um, but I think it really takes community engagement, health campaigns, patient education, as was mentioned earlier, um, to have the patient understand why surveillance is important. The, the posters in the clinic, I think, is, is a key uh, intervention. Finally, you know, when we detect a nodule on ultrasound, we need to have a strong recall system in place. So we need to have a way to contact that patient, have the patient come for follow-up testing and not get lost. I think one of the things that also, you know, maybe wasn't pointed out earlier is that HEC surveillance, um, it likened it to getting, you know, mammography or other cancer screenings. HEC screening has to happen every six months. So this is a cascade that the patient has to complete repeatedly, making it even more challenging. Um, so one of the projects uh, that was uh, led by Amit, um, but also um, with Ruben Herneas here at, at the uh, Houston VA, was this mailed outreach study where essentially a one-page letter in either English or Spanish, low literacy level, was mailed to patients um, at these three centers, inviting them to complete HCC screening. And you can see that this really worked. The, the rates are still low, we still have some room to go, but it increased um, surveillance from 21% up to 35% completion rate. And you can see there on the right that some of the groups that benefited the most from this intervention are these difficult to reach groups. These were people at safety net hospitals, these were um, racial and ethnic minorities. Um, as Sumit mentioned, we really need multi-level and multidisciplinary interventions to be able to improve screening rates. These are just a couple examples that have been published, um, but it, it shows us that we can be innovative in how we think about uh, designing in interventions. It doesn't need to include an MD. So nurse-led clinics have actually had a lot of success in the Kaiser system. There's been pharmacist-led teams where they identified patients in the EMR and pharmacists called the patients, scheduled their ultrasound. So it doesn't need to include, a, you know, hepatologists, we can't see all the patients as we mentioned. So I'll just leave you um, here at the end with talking about some gaps in treatment and how we might address those. You've heard uh, from several of the folks before me that look at this algorithm. HCC uh, treatment is becoming increasingly complex. This is the updated 2012 uh, or yeah, 20, 2022 uh, uh, guidance that we have um, on liver cancer staging and treatment. But you can see, I mean, you can barely fit it on the slide. It's quite complicated. So we need multidisciplinary care, as Sumit mentioned. You can see all of the subspecialties here that are included. And, you know, I showed you 71 per, uh, counties in Texas don't even have a hospital. So certainly many hospitals are not going to have all of these providers. We know that multidisciplinary care, it reduces delays in care, it improves guideline concordant care, improves survival. But if we don't have, if the patient doesn't have access to this, it's, it's not gonna help them. So one of the interventions that's been done is using telemedicine, similar with Project ECHO, um, to try to do these virtual tumor boards, which I think is really a, a great area that we need to expand further. This has been being done in the VA um, and being uh, branched out to other areas. But this can, of course, improve access for the rural patients, minimize the transportation issue and costs. However, I think with telemedicine, we really have to be mindful that dis telemedicine can widen disparities. And we've seen that during the COVID pandemic. Not everybody has broadband internet or smartphones. Um, and so, you know, sometimes with innovation, um, we, by improving care for some, we can, we can worsen it for others. Um, finally, I'll just leave you with this. Um, uh, Dr. Kassab mentioned, you know, we have these immunotherapy regimens, we have chemotherapy that, uh, or immunotherapy and these um, uh, local regional treatments, um, particularly for chemotherapy, or sorry, particularly for immunotherapy. You know, we have a lot of clinical trials right now, but again, patients may not have access to any of these drugs, infusion centers, clinical trials. This was a really interesting intervention that was done for rural patients in Iowa, Minnesota, and South Dakota, low cost, they had 26 counties that didn't have access to any tertiary care for cancer. And they used a telehealth-based intervention where they trained rural infusion teams, they coordinated the treatment plans, they directed them how to administer the chemotherapy, and these patients were actually enrolled in clinical trials. Um, and you can see the benefits in the purple box that this um, led to for the patients, significant cost savings, saving patients time. So I'm just gonna leave you with, you know, we can do these smaller interventions on a, 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 you know, patient education. We can do community-based interventions, but we really need to address social determinants of health in our community and via policy. 
I think that there's several areas here that fit in nicely, particularly with NAFLD, where we really need to think on a broader level. It's not just counseling one patient about their um, their nutrition, uh, but rather, you know, ensuring do we have um, uh, green spaces, do we have availability of healthy foods for all, and some of that is on the policy level. So in summary, there are persistent, significant disparities in early detection, diagnosis, and treatment of HCC in Texas, even in the year 2022. Um, we know that there are, HCC screening is poorly util utilized. We know that many patients are not receiving curative treatment despite being eligible. And we know that this is disproportionately impacting racial ethnic minorities, the uninsured, underinsured, and those in rural Texas, I, th I think is really a place where we need to intervene. Um, these barriers can occur across the care continuum, sh showing you again there. And we really need multi-level, multidisciplinary interventions urgently to try to improve survival for all of our patients. I think it begins with the recognition of cirrhosis, as others have mentioned, um, and removing logistical barriers for patient, which may include telemedicine. I think the focus on expanding access, we do just need to be mindful um, that we're addressing the social determinants of health. Patient navigation is a key component. Um, and targeted interventions for our difficult to reach patient populations. So thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, any questions from the people who have been sitting for a while? Can't you see the trend? I mean, uh, the, the first session is prevention, big picture, etc. But you get the second session, and I think it's intentionally, once you have the cancer, it is tough, it's expensive, the slides are incomprehensible, and all of those things. <laughs> but, but, but that's by design, and, and uh, that doesn't mean we neglect this part, but, but that's really the spectrum. These are the choices. Um, any, any comments or questions? Uh, Dr. Turner. Yeah, social determinants of health, that's something we're all wrestling with, and I think you really did a great job of, of highlighting that. Um, so do you think there are any low-hanging fruit here? It seems all pretty high-hanging, but I'm just wondering what you think you might want to start with first to try to really get the ball moving. Well, we have four speakers, so each one uses a fruit or a vegetable. <laughs> Maybe I'll start so I can get the lowest hanging. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's a great, because all of these seem like such pie in the sky ideas, right? I think one of the things, especially with NAFLD, is that's ripe um, for intervention on a large scale level would be interventions in childhood, you know, childhood obesity being a huge issue, NAFLD being increasingly common in children and trying to design an intervention in schools, whether it be with uh, nutrition in schools, exercise in schools, and trying to kind of reach people at an early stage and move forward. There's been um, the Healthy People campaign. Uh, Michelle Obama had a um, nutritional campaign, having celebrities kind of, I, I think those are some of the higher level uh, things uh, from a policy standpoint um, that would help uh, address a lower hanging social determinant of health. But Thank clearly you. access to care insurance, you know, is, is key. Dr. Kasson. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think access to care uh, really from childhood you know, can really help us. First of all, all of my patients in clinic, I wish I, I, I had never met them. I, I don't want to see anyone in clinic, but when I see a patient who's healthy, you know, um, diagnosed early, these are the patients that we can really make a huge impact uh, with. And those patients are usual, usually, you know, insured all their life. They have the, the vaccination, they have the preventive and screening services and so on, while I see some patients who have never seen a physician up until a month ago and all of that, so you really see the, the brunt of all of these, you know, um, barriers to access to health care. So it goes back to the same thing we were talking about, big dreams. We need big champions here. We need people who take this and maybe we can start with our state of Texas who are very equipped, you know, we have the capital here, you know, they're always determined, they always balance the budget, they have these things in mind. So I really think we should take this into our hands, just like the separate program started, you know, these efforts, we need higher level efforts to make sure that everybody has access to not only a standard of care, but also to clinical trials to give them the best outcome possible. Thank you. Um, 
Um, so I'll, I'll go back to, I mean, I, I love this adage of like an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so like, I, I really do think when you think of this across the entire spectrum, you know, the prevention side and really the primary prevention side is, is the most effective and the cheapest, quote unquote, cheapest implementation that we can do. And so I, I really do think that the efforts need to start there. Um, you know, to Hashim's point, you've seen that as you go from primary prevention to secondary prevention to treatment, you're impacting a smaller and smaller proportion and you're increasing the cost exponentially. And so I, I think you really need to start on the primary prevention side. So I, I, I'd reinforce that concept is the first thing. Um, you know, to, to complement what Nicole said, I mean, there's clearly and rightfully so a big focus on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, but I think when we have to think of this, we have to remember that it's not just NAFLD. I mean, when we talk about non-viral etiologies, we're also talking about alcohol-associated liver disease. And we've seen that this is already common, and we've seen dramatic increases in this um, during the COVID pandemic. And so um, I think that's the other aspect that we need to be very aggressive in, in terms of you know, um, alcohol regulation, alcohol education campaigns, in terms of reducing um, so you have, you know, Sumit said this, I mean, many of us sort of do have healthy, I hope healthy, <laughs> alcohol use intake. And so like, I mean, there is a way to do this um, in a healthy fashion, but I think that it, it can't be abstinence for everyone, but I think we need, you know, healthy alcohol and alcohol regulation. So I, I think we need to think through this. Um, there have been uh, studies, and I think Sumit probably is probably better to speak to this than I, I am, in terms of even some of the policies that have come in from a state um, perspective in terms of regulating alcohol that have been effective in terms of curbing some of the alcohol abuse. Um, so I think these are things that we can consider. Yours. Not to throw you under the bus there. I hope no, it's, it's, uh, I, I think education. Uh, I think we need to be more aware first at, at every single level. And I, I, I think we need some kind of sexy tagline. Like, <laughs> like what's liver? Like, I don't know. So if y'all can think of something cool that, you know, which is marketable package, you know, and you can say it around, people will then think about it and, you know, it becomes part of your lingo. Oh yeah, what about your liver? You know, but I, I don't think anybody thinks about the liver. Like even in my house, my wife's a cardiologist. They're like, oh, I want to be a cardiologist, not a hepatologist. So, so I think, I think it's just, we need some kind of, I like, like what's liver, our- Liver is the new red. I like that. Yeah, yeah, I like go. that. I sort of wanted to copy that slide. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, maybe I'll just ask so Dr. Kasap one question. It's, you know, so Nicole brought up the, the, Dr. Rich brought up this thing about, you know, virtual tumor boards. And then how, how would you like, I mean, MD Anderson is a big name, right? It's a recognized name. Like, how would you promote virtual tumor boards? Or have you all done that? The number yes. one cancer hospital in the world. <laughs> Just that <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Hashim. Making, I didn't pay him to say making, that. Making <laughs> cancer history. There we go. <laughs> so uh, we, we have had these efforts, but... Um, Unfortunately, it was kind of limited to um, the easy access through our system, so through our cancer network, for example. So we have virtual tumor boards for different cancers, including liver. We're trying now to lift up something through the community, but it goes back to the uh, policy you know, issues in terms of how to um, access the databases for those you know, physicians and how to um, start contacting them and getting them on board. And, and there is nothing, no incentives, right? No reward to doing that. So you do it on top of everything else you're doing. So the virtual team on board setting would be perfect for patients in the rural areas because it can provide their physicians with the opportunity to present those cases and get a, a, an opinion because those patients cannot travel. So they present the case, they identified and everything, and that's back again to the policy, right? Because there is so many hurdles. I can tell you the virtual tumor board for the liver, it took us three years to get it through our IRB and all the red tapes because guess what? Even just looking at the outcome, we wanted to do the virtual tumor board in Texas in the community settings and compare the outcome um, before and after. And they said, no, you have to have uh, the consent of every single patient patient, even at a distance, to be able, even though it's de-identified and everything. So these are things that our policymakers can help us with, you know, it provide us with a mechanism to enable us as physicians to do these kinds of, you know, approaches and trials and, 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 and collaborations without so many red tapes. And I think Texas, among all states, would be perfect for that. Um, so, so, so Mike, can I, can I just add one thing no, about the virtual tumor boards? I think the other thing we have to recognize is that the virtual tumor board is just the first step. It gives you the recommendation for that treatment. Um, but you know, to Nicole's point, I mean, many of these areas don't have hospital systems, don't have the expertise. And so we've done some of these virtual tumor boards for some of the rural areas and we're like, this patient would be a perfect surgical candidate. And they're like, we don't have anyone who has expertise in terms of delivering that. 
you don't have access to transplant. You don't have access to some of those treatments. And so I think this is, I mean, this is not a low hanging fruit. This is probably the highest hanging fruit that you can have. But I, I think that we need to work on sort of having it so there's also that expertise more broadly. If it's not locally, at least regionally, in terms of having surgical expertise, um, IR expertise, et cetera. So I, I think this is the other thing is it, it's not just about that recommendation. It's about having treatment capacity to give it locally. I think my, my low hanging fruit uh, will be sort of a bridge between the morning session and this session, which is the identification of people with advanced liver disease or cirrhosis. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is, the, this is the population where early detection and screening and surveillance has a potential for improving things down the line. And I think leveraging the issues that were mentioned in EMRs and et cetera may, may get us there. Um, so, so that's my low-hanging fruit. Uh, I want to conclude this, and we're going to take a picture, but, but I'm glad you're asking about this, and, and it just reminded me of this quote that, my fruit is tomato, so knowledge uh, is to know that a tomato is actually a fruit, not a vegetable, <laughs> and wisdom uh, is not to put it in a fruit salad, and philosophy is ketchup really a smoothie. So, <laughs> so now we're going to take a, a group picture. Uh, after the group pic picture, uh, we're going to go grab lunch. We'll come back for the talk by Dr. Ward. Uh, after that, and this is really, uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Deshpande's talk uh, for the insurers, uh, for the payers' perspective. Then Dr. Conwell, who's probably the wisest person I know in this crowd or any crowd, is going to sum up the meeting, and then we'll do uh, our multi-stake. So let's gather in front. Um, people are aware of their own height, so try, <laughs> try to be at the front. And Dr. Thrift, please, at the very back. <laughs>